Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. I'm here with Rob Hertberg. Where'd you fly in from in this zero? Betty, I just came in from Camarillo, the airport there in that city uh, from the commemorative Air Force unit. So that's where the, the zero is based? That's correct. Oh, wow. We have about um, 12 airplanes, different airplanes, uh, primarily World War II vintage, and this is one of them. Oh, wow. How did you get into flying the zero? Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, sure, I was able to uh, to fly uh, F-16s in the Air Force, so I built up a lot of time there. And uh, through the air show uh, business, I got uh, to uh, befriend and get associated with the group at Camarillo. Uh, I also um, bought into a, a T-6 after I retired from the military, and I built up time in Warbirds with radial engines and tail draggers. And uh, one thing led to the next, and I went through the checkout program. Uh, extremely fortunate and now here I am with this beauty behind me. Can you tell us how the Zero compares to some of the other World War II Warbirds? Betty, this is the only uh, World War II fighter that I currently fly. Uh, I'm hoping to get into some of the other airplanes we have at the museum here shortly. But what I understand uh, as far as turning and climbing this airplane still from the beginning all the way through to the end of the war was very tough for our aircraft to beat. Uh, in the early parts of the war, um, we didn't know that quite yet. We were learning how to fight this airplane, and if we turned with it, that was bad news. So we learned not to turn with the airplane uh, just because it has such great turning performance. It is not as fast as the other airplanes, especially as, as our airplanes progressed through the war, and we went to a more powerful aircraft that could go faster than those aircraft could outrun this airplane. But all the way through the end of the war, uh, our pilots did not want to turn with this airplane because that was bad news for us. How many Zeros are still flying today? To our knowledge, there are currently five Zeros that are still flying in the world today. And a couple we know of that are going uh, through restoration and hopefully will be uh, flying uh, around the country and the world uh, in the next year or two. Uh, the aircraft behind us, was uh, manufactured by uh, Mitsubishi, came off the plant in 42. Uh, the, the combat records are not complete. Uh, they were kind of taken care of after the war as part of the, the surrender terms. But we know it was found uh, at an abandoned airport or uh, airfield, Japanese airfield uh, in the um, uh, New Guinea in that area right there, and it was brought back to the United States in the early 90s with a couple other airplanes that were found uh, abandoned in the jungles. Uh, initially, uh, some work was done at Santa Monica, to, then the airplanes were sent over to Russia for restoration. They came back uh, without engines. That was the uh, direction of the owner at the time. So everything else was done in Russia. There are some uh, instruments in the airplane that have uh, Cyrillic written on it, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, after he came back to the States uh, about in the mid-90s, uh, our airplane went to Chino, to the fighter rebuilders there, and they put the engine on and did all the other things necessary uh, to include the paperwork with the FAA to get it uh, cleared to fly in the United States. And then it's been uh, with us at the Camarillo uh, uh, Commemorative Air Force Unit uh, ever since. How did Allied fighters learn how to successfully fight the Zero? As I mentioned earlier, uh, what we didn't know at the start was how well this airplane could turn. So we would turn against it and that didn't end up very well for us uh, many times. So what we learned how to do was to keep our speed up, 
to not turn with them. We developed excellent tactics. That was primarily the Navy folks uh, who, who were fly, flying F4F Wildcats at the time. So we developed really innovative and good uh, two-ship and four-ship tactics to help deal with the airplane. And we learned to, to do hit-and-run type attacks to keep our airspeed up. Uh, until we got into our later, more powerful aircraft, we did not go uh, vertical with the airplane. So if the Zero pilot wanted to take the fight up into the vertical in our earlier airplanes, that was tough for us to keep up with it because it could climb so well. So we learned not to do that. Uh, keep our speed up, dashing attacks, hit and run. Uh, the, this aircraft did not accelerate very well going downhill where our heavier armored aircraft would. So we would run away from it, do a, a hit and run type attack, throwing some bullets out there to try and take care of it, and then run away and descend down to low altitudes and we could run away from it. What is the crowd response as you fly this zero into air shows? Betty, that's the, another part uh, of why I feel so honored to fly this airplane, uh, not only to fly it uh, and feel the nostalgia and the history of sitting in this cockpit and actually flying the airplane, especially if I'm in formation with some other World War II aircraft, uh, but it's also the reaction I see from the crowd when I take it uh, to an air show uh, or to any kind of event where uh, the, the general public gets to come out, maybe people who don't uh, visit air shows much. But it's just uh, an overwhelming response. Uh, it's true love for uh, the airplanes, and, and I really feel a sense of gratitude from the people uh, for us being able to keep it in the air and share this uh, living treasure with them. Could we have a closer up look of the Zero, and can you talk about the design of the Zero? Absolutely, Betty. Let's get to it. All right, Betty, why don't we uh, take a walk around this airplane. We'll talk a little bit about the design, a little bit about the performance, a little bit about the restoration, and also a little bit about uh, the particulars of the airplane and, and how it was able to do what it did so well. So uh, hopefully you can see from here where the landing gear is very uh, widely spaced apart. But as the pilot, what I really like about that wide spread there is the, the very stable, uh, performance and uh, characteristics that it has on the ground both in takeoff and in landing once you put this thing on the ground it really wants to go straight and a lot of that's influenced by this nice wide tall landing gear if we move in a little bit closer I want to point out this is the original landing gear that they found that was still on the airplane uh, from the 40s so this was manufactured uh, very little had to be done in the restoration of these landing gear. They were as is as it came off the plant in 42. Uh, the markings here, this yellow, was painted on the airplane to help the pilots identify each other. A lot of times some of these airplanes, if you weren't super close to them, looked the same based on the aspect that you were looking at them. Well, this was a feature, a color feature in the air that might help a pilot know, hey, that's another zero, he's a friendly, so I'm not gonna tear into him. Also, here's, um, this aircraft was armed with two, one in each wing, 20 millimeter cannons. If you can, Betty, if you can move up a little bit to the top of the cowling, you can see the holes up top there. There were two, one on each side of the cowling, 7.7 .7 millimeter uh, machine guns up in there. So a 7.7 .7 millimeter is about our 30 caliber. This 20 millimeter would have equated to about an 80 caliber. So especially earlier in the war, this was heavy metal. This was a large uh, and high powered ordnance. All right, to, but Betty, to talk a, f a little bit about some of the design features of this, and by design, I no kidding mean the Mitsubishi engineers uh, and their challenge to meet the requirements of the Japanese Navy set out for them and the two big ones there were uh, very long range requirements uh, especially for a single seat fighter and then uh, extreme maneuverability well to meet those requirements they had to cut weight everywhere cut weight cut weight cut weight and one of the things they did to do that was this uh, dura aluminum which is still a, uh, a standard in the aircraft industry uh, this uh, today well, they uh, came up with that to, to help them with those requirements. So the aluminum all over the airplane is extremely thin, extremely thin aluminum. This is a pretty uh, unique feature of this airplane. This is an A6M3, so a third model, uh, if you will, of the airplane here. 
and they decided on this one to, to take advantage of this uh, approximately two feet on each wing tip and they put in this wing fold mechanism. Again, this was a Japanese Navy aircraft, so it lived and fought off of an aircraft carrier where space is at a premium. And they figured uh, this four, roughly four feet total uh, with uh, the wing tip bends on each side would give them roughly space for another aircraft for every 10 to 11 aircraft they put on there. They couldn't uh, break the wing, if you will, and fold it in any uh, closer, which would have given them more space because that would have added weight. All of the hydraulic uh, actuators and mechanisms needed to break the wing further in towards the uh, fuselage would have added weight to the aircraft and they didn't want to do that. Here's another real interesting design feature, Betty. If you can see this really, really long aileron right here. This did uh, two main things in addition to the other design features of the airplane. One good, one bad. The good part was with such a long aileron here, it gave the great maneuverability this aircraft had at what we would call slower speeds. So up to about 200 knots, uh, this thing could turn and it would outturn most of our fighters all the way up to the end of the war. Uh, the bad part, because it deflect so much air when you move this once this airplane got going faster it reduced its ability to turn tightly and we uh, took advantage of that uh, later in the war when we figured that out uh, by getting and staying fast and turning the the zero could not uh, stay up with our airplanes all right betty here's a real good place where you can illustrate that real thin aluminum used on this airplane this big uh, red rectangle here directly below it is where the flap is. So the flap extends down uh, below uh, the aircraft here. And then there isn't the supporting wing structure that you see in the rest of the wing. And based on that real thin aluminum, this is a no step area because you could possibly go right through the aluminum. Illustrates really how thin that aluminum was to get the light weight needed to meet the Navy requirements. Here is the classic meatball of aviation lore in World War II history. The aircraft back then usually fairly brightly colored with the extra insignia on the airplane to help with identification. And this is what identified the, uh, the uh, country of Japan. And we came to call it the meatball and it identified to us and to themselves that this was a Japanese airplane. This is uh, pretty uh, interesting here. This is the uh, identification that was put on the aircraft by uh, the manufacturer, Mitsubishi, and the Japanese Navy to identify this particular airplane with its serial number and then the manufacturer and the model number. And if you can see, A6M3. I've mentioned several times that this is a Japanese Navy airplane and it did live and fight off of an aircraft carrier. I'm gonna show something that's kind of difficult to see, but if you can follow my hand in here, you can see the bottom of the hook. It's secured up into the airplane for flight or any time it wouldn't be needed to catch that wire when it was coming back to land on the aircraft carrier. What I'm touching with my finger here, that's the bottom of the hook. And uh, when the pilot selected it, this hook would come down and extend down from the bottom of the fuselage so that when he came in to land on a carrier, he would catch the wire in this hook and that would arrest the aircraft and, and bring it to a stop. Betty, we're back here at the very uh, tail of the airplane uh, by the rudder. If you remember just a little bit ago, we looked at the placard that was uh, inscribed on the side of the airplane with its serial number. You know, that would have been the contractual kind of number between uh, the manufacturer, Mitsubishi, and the Navy. Well, this, once the airplane gets into an active uh, unit, uh, a group or squadron or flight, these would have been markings that the uh, that that unit would have put on it. The blue stripes would have been some kind of identifier either for the group or the squadron, perhaps even an individual like a squadron commander. And then the Navy, the Japanese Navy would have put on its own individual uh, aircraft marking, not the serial number, but a, an aircraft number. And that's what the X-133 that we see on this airplane uh, identifies. All right, Betty, we're kind of back where we started. We started here and kind of walked around the left side of the airplane all the way back to the tail. Well, the right side would have been just the same. But now we're back here with the engine and I want to talk uh, about it. Uh, a lot of people ask about this engine. Uh, this is a Pratt & Whitney. It's an 1830 engine, the same engine you'd find on a DC-3 or C-47. At the time, 
that uh, the Japanese were gearing up and in the early part of uh, World War II, they had license built agreements with uh, McDonnell Douglas to build the DC-3, with Pratt & Whitney to build this engine, and even Hamilton uh, Standard to build the prop. So what they did as they were designing the Zero here, remember how many times I've mentioned they wanted less weight. They really had to cut weight and cut weight. So what they did was they reverse engineered the Pratt & Whitney 1830, uh, Nakajima did, into the Sakai engine that they ended up putting on the Zero. It was a little bit um, narrower in circumference. It was a little bit lighter. It had just a little bit fewer horsepower than this. Uh, but that's um, that uh, is why when this aircraft was restored, the decision was made to put Pratt & Whitney's on it because they were so similar in size and performance and also because current day, there's just a little more knowledge, spare parts, uh, being able to maintain a Pratt than a Nakajima engine. All right, uh, Betty, we're up on top of the wing here and I'd like to show you inside the cockpit of this beauty. Well, first we'll kind of start right here, obviously the stick that makes this thing go. Uh, on it, this is an a restoration edition that's for smoke oil looks good at air shows and this is a uh, hydraulic so uh, we push that button right there and that energizes the uh, hydraulic system it's an electrical hydraulic pump for gear and flaps um, starting back here this is real interesting I think and uh, we use terms like ergonomics and human factors in the design of our airplanes today well this is the flap switch and it'll be hard for you to see, but that's the tip, so that black, that's the landing gear handle, and this is the flap switch, okay? So that um, actuates the flaps. As you notice, they're on the right side of the cockpit, so on takeoff, the pilot has to take his right hand off the control stick, fly with the left hand to get his right hand down off uh, just outside his right leg and actuate the gear and or flap handles. So that's not the uh, ergonomically best setup, but that's the way they made it. Uh, we talked about uh, the restoration of this aircraft, came out of the jungles, uh, initially started here in Santa Monica, but then sent over to Russia for restoration. Well, back in the early part of the war, the Japanese didn't have radios in their airplane. They were using Morse code. But you can see the Russian uh, language, I think that's Cyrillic right there, on this Morse code uh, piece of equipment right here. This would have been radios up here. We also talked earlier, remember, there were 20 millimeter cannons in the wing and 7.7 mil millimeter uh, machine guns mounted on top of the engine that fired through a uh, synchronized uh, spinning of the propeller. Well, the breech of that, those machine guns extends all the way back here into the cockpit. You can even see the cocking lever where the pilot had to manually cock his machine guns before he, we, he was to fire them. Uh, over here, these instruments are primarily your engine instruments. Betty, if you can zoom in, as an example, you can still see the original Japanese marking uh, on the instrument panel for these instruments. And in many cases, like right here, we've had to paint on there in English what uh, the instrument means. So fuel pressure, oil pressure, oil temp, because, and we're proud of this, the original markings are still the Japanese ones. Uh, right up here, this is uh, a few of these instruments have uh, been updated to modern standards uh, just because for accuracy and flying around in our uh, airspace system. But obviously we needed to put in some modern radios uh, just to communicate and be safe. All right, over on the left side, more performance indicators. So here's your airspeed and your altitude and then getting this thing started. Here's the left-hand machine gun as it extends with the, the cocking lever right there. So now we're on the left side of the front console up against the fuselage, the throttle quadrant here, propeller mixture. Uh, this is real interesting. Here, this little switch right here is what I talked about earlier. It doesn't really work too well right now, but 
had the pilot thumb that forward this direction, he would have selected his 7.7 millimeter machine guns on top of the nose. If he thumbed it backwards that way, then he would have selected both the nose machine guns and those wing mounted 20 millimeter cannons. And so again, this is the throttle here and this lever. Uh, today, this is what I use. I pinch this backwards. That's what I use to activate the radio and communicate on the radio. Uh, back in World War II, this was the, the gun trigger. So again, the pilot selects which gun or guns he wants with this switch, and then he would squeeze that lever to actually fire the machine guns or the cannon in the wings. If we go down this way, Betty, there are some switches here we're not exactly sure of. This one down here, it's in op right now. That may have been the hook to release the hook so the uh, tail hook would have dropped down when he came back into land. Uh, it may have been a bomb release lever as well. And uh, here I think people will find this interesting. This is the elevator trim right now and that is the only trim that's adjustable from the cockpit. Uh, from inside the cockpit, the pilot cannot adjust rudder trim or aileron trim. So all he can do is use this little wheel here and notice the bicycle chain that, that goes back into the fuselage and then connects to wires. And that is to uh, adjust the trim on the elevator. Okay, this little knob right here, uh, which is on the inboard closest to the pilot, is, um, was a bomb release lever right here. We have it safety wired. Obviously, we're not uh, uh, dropping bombs off the airplane at air shows. That would be realistic though, wouldn't it? Uh, so it's safety wired to the back position. Uh, this was another one for bomb release, but what we use it for is the tail wheel uh, lock and unlock. So when I move that lever uh, forward, that locks the tail wheel in a streamlined uh, configuration for retraction up into the fuselage. And then to help move the aircraft around on the ground, we unlock the tail wheel by sliding that thing back. Rob, thank you for flying in this aviation legend here for us to have a closer up look. You, you bet, Betty. I'm really honored to be able to fly this thing. And anytime I can take it somewhere, uh, I'm just really happy to do that to share it with uh, the public. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.